Well, welcome indeed, listener, to this uh, monumental, dare I say, episode of Beyond the Crucible. Uh, that was and will soon be again Warwick Fairfax, the founder of Crucible Leadership and the host of this show. I am Gary Schneeberger, the communications director for Crucible Leadership and the co-host of the show. And I say monumental because this Warwick is our 50th episode. Can you believe it? No, I can't. I mean, it's hard to believe <laughs> that, you know, we started this a little over a year ago in November, 50 episodes. I mean, that's, who knew? That's just staggering. Hard to believe. And what we wanted to do, right? We wanted to, because, you know, like in Hollywood, when a TV show has a hundred episodes, they have a party and they have a cake. And unfortunately we can't share cake together right now, but uh, we wanted to mark the occasion with, uh, with a special 50th episode. And um, the idea behind the 50th episode that we're going to go on as we go through is, is uh, talk about some of uh, the most insightful guests, uh, the guests that we remember um, perhaps the best over the time that we've been doing the show, as you said, for just over a year. And um, uh, one of the things, Warwick, that I found when I was doing some research, even though I'm not a numbers guy, um, how many hours of content do you think over the, the 49 episodes, now 50th, but how many hours of content do you think we've had? I don't know, like 30, 40. Woo! Bravo, bravo. <laughs> we are, by the time this episode is finished, we will have about 40 hours of content oh, wow. since, okay. since starting Beyond the Crucible. <laughs> and think about that for a minute. That consumes the traditional work week, right? The traditional <laughs> American work week is 40 hours. We have an American works week, work week's worth of shows uh, of this podcast. And uh, that's... That's pretty. Uh, that's a, that's a pretty good reason to celebrate. I think. Absolutely, yeah. It's uh, it's a huge milestone, and as I, well, obviously, we'll talk about just the diversity of guests and backgrounds and experiences. It's just, um, I mean, I've learned a lot as I've listened to uh, the folks who have been interviewing and the dialogues we've had, and um, yeah, it's just been a tremendous learning experience for me, and uh, I've you know loved being part of it. Yeah, the uh, to your point about diversity, we've had uh, business leaders, community leaders, nonprofit leaders, thought leaders, adventurers, and academics who have uh, shared the microphones with us. Uh, we've had a Hollywood actor, producer, uh, writer, director on one side. We've had a young woman who sells cookies out of her driveway. Um, there's such diversity, but the one thing that uh, that they all have in common a couple things they all have in common. They've either been through uh, a crucible or crucibles, uh, sometimes very traumatic trials and tragedies and failures and setbacks, uh, or they've been through maybe a couple of crucibles that maybe weren't as, as, as intense, but they have a perspective on how listeners can bounce back from crucibles. And that's really been, as you look at the, at the, the portfolio of guests we've had, that all of that, that it all boils down to right the vision uh, that was hatched when the show was started of helping people get beyond their crucibles, offering hope and insight in how to do that. Absolutely. And you know, it's just remarkable to me. I mean, you mentioned diversity. We've had men, women, we've had people of all different kind of backgrounds, races, all different countries, um, of a huge variety of, of crucibles from abuse to abandoned orphan to Navy SEAL being paralyzed in a training accident, um, former NFL quarterback, uh, business challenges, a huge variety of diversity in every, uh, in every form of that word. But you're right, there's a couple of things that we'll talk about that are similar in every guest we've had uh, that they've not let the crucible as you say at the end of every podcast, you know, not right. that the crucible will be the end of this story, but an exciting new chapter. They've not given up. They've not let a tragedy define them. Uh, they have hope. They've not let forgiveness, they've not let grudges or anger sometimes, obviously in the case of abuse, there's a lot of grounds for anger. They've not let any of that hold them back. 
right. um, the, the traits of what it takes to overcome a crucible are very similar despite the radically different experiences and the diversity of the guests. That was what is probably one of the single most amazing things to me, single most yeah. learning points for my, myself personally. For sure. And one of the things I thought of right before we got on here, and we haven't really talked about this in a year. I mean, we haven't talked about this since we just started. But do you remember back when we first started the show and there was concern on our parts that, oh my goodness. So what makes the podcast interesting is that people don't talk about failure much. So we're going to have content that other people don't have. But wait a minute, if people don't talk about failure much, how are we going to find guests? And I remember, <laughs> I remember early on, there was a concern on our parts that we were going to, how are we going to find guests? And that has not proven to be a problem. I mean, we are, uh, we are 32 guests into the show so far. And as you said, uh, great diversity in, in their experiences. And then that common denominator of not giving up, of, 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 pers of, of persevering through the crucible. And what we've really appreciated about our guests is they've been willing to be vulnerable, to go there. I mean, that's the core of uh, uh, Beyond the Crucible, the core of the book, which um, in a sense the book, uh, Crucible Leadership, which will be released next year, birthed Beyond the Crucible. But that's the core idea. I've been very open about my own experiences growing up in a large family media business, and after my failed $2.25 billion takeover, um, the trauma that, well, you know, the, the, maybe trauma is too strong a word, but certainly the challenges it posed in my life. You know, I've tried to be open and vulnerable about what I went through and what I've learned, but I guess I've also been very open. And one of the things it's important to me is I don't want to just hear what happened. I want to hear how they felt. Right. Uh, as in the tragedy, not just to dwell on the pain, but so when they talk about the hope they have now, the listener understands there's a sort of a yin and yang, two so different sides of the same coin of of the tr of the pain of the tragedy, but then the hope and the joy that's come later. So, I, emotion, hearing the emotion behind the story is really important to us. And I'd say every guest has gone there. Every guest has been open and vulnerable about what they felt. And their emotions. Yeah, absolutely. And, and in fact, and we'll hear some of them as we talk through the guests that we're, that we're highlighting um, here. We'll hear some of them express that for the first time, uh, in, in some cases, in, in, in having the conversation with us, um, they've realized certain points about their, their journey back from the crucible. Um, uh, absolutely. You know, there's, there's one thing I kind of wanted to add and, um, you know, obviously we've been thinking about Beyond the Crucible. It's interesting to kind of look back on, uh, on you know, how did we get here? Um, you know, how did we get to Beyond the Crucible? And um, it's really, as I was reflecting last night, I sort of thought quite a bit about vision and how visions can grow. Right. And I remember, as listeners will know, in 2008, when at my church in Annapolis, Maryland, where we live from Australia, but we lived here for gosh, maybe 30 years, a long time. Um, and I was giving a message about my story and, you know, like a 10 minute message to illustrate some sermon point. And I figure who could relate to my story? Failed media mogul. Nobody knows anything about a straighter in, in the US, certainly not about Fairfax media. Um, and somehow my story kind of resonated and I was open and vulnerable and, you know, what I went through, what I learned. So that, you know, then I started writing uh, crucible leadership uh, about my anchored by my story and stories of my family and some inspirational historical leaders. And then that grew into, well, to sell a book or to get it published, you've got to have a brand. So then, you know, uh, we have a great branding and marketing team and signal that helped uh, I mean, with the website and blogs and social media. You came on board with Roar and helped me with public relations and now just with the book and, um, so many things uh, with the podcast. Uh, Carrie came on board to help with um, uh, help selling the book and marketing strategy for the book. All of this grew. And then, as you say, about a year ago, we had this conversation. Um, well, how about a podcast? I've been on some other people's podcasts and right. I'm somewhat of a reserved person. So, okay, well, let's see how this works. And, and it works. So the point of the story is, you know, one of the things I've learned is visions grow. You mm. started off with, 
I want to get a book published. Oh, I guess I need a brand. Huh. Well, I guess, <laughs> I guess I need a blog. Okay. Social media. I'm not somebody that posts a lot on social media, you know, just in terms of my generation, something I really have an excessive need to do, but I realize it's important to get your message out and I want to get my message out. Right. So, okay. Podcast. Okay. That's another good way of talking about your message. So this wasn't some big grand plan other than publish the book. So I think for listeners, when you have a vision, realize it can grow and that's okay. And your comfort zone can move and just step by step, bit by bit, visions can grow and that's good. Yeah. And, and from the perspective that we had starting out that I mentioned that, geez, okay, people don't like to talk about failure. How are we going to find people to talk about failure? <laughs> um, we did. And, and not only did we find people to talk about their crucibles, uh, in, in, in honesty and transparency and detail. But one of the things that we sort of uh, have done to help guide us a roadmap to get us um, through this episode is that we, we discovered what uh, I've called sort of a three-by-three three approach to uh, what we've accomplished at uh, Beyond the Crucible and how we're going to go through this episode. And that is we found basically three kinds of shows. We produce three kinds of shows um, one each week here at Beyond the Crucible. Um, one kind of show is <clears throat> about people's crucibles. Uh, and that's the, the vast majority of the shows that we do are people who have had crucible experiences telling their story of how they have bounced back, moved beyond those crucible experiences and are now pursuing and living lives of significance. That's the one kind of show. Second kind of show are, uh, we added this a little bit later on in the process, earlier this year. Actually, since this is, this is January 5th when you're hearing this, this is actually, that was later last year. Um, uh, perspective guests, guests who maybe don't have um, the most searing crucibles to keep up with the metaphor of, of a, of a, a a fiery uh, furnace that melts uh, metal, but they have a great perspective to help people who are coming back from their crucibles understand how to do that. So we've got crucible guests and, and perspective guests. And then from the outset, we've had these shows, Warwick, that um, it's just the two of us having the conversation. And the reason behind that, the reason that we wanted to go there from the start is based on what you talked about just a little bit ago is your journey in coming to start the, start the podcast was your own crucible and your own experience in unpacking what you learned as you came back from your crucible. So having those three kinds of shows has been, um, has made, I think, a, uh, for a, a diverse um, uh, set of circumstances and conversations, don't you think? Absolutely. Um, you know, I've really enjoyed just the diversity of the guests and talking about that. But then we've had uh, thought leaders and we'll talk about uh, some of them um, later, like uh, you know, uh, Professor Joseph Badaracco, um or Badaracco of Harvard Business School. And uh, he's written a couple books um, that we'll chat about, um, uh, Leading Quietly and Step Back. And sometimes I um, as people, as we talk to either guests or who have crucibles or perspective guests, they'll say something. So, and we'll chat about this later, but Professor Badaracco talked about, you know, quiet leadership versus heroic leadership. And it occurred to me, I grew up with a heroic leadership model. So we ended up mm -hmm. doing a perspective, well, I'm sorry, a conversation between the two of us, unpacking more about heroic leadership. And we've done ones on vulnerability and significance and a whole bunch of them. So sometimes there are things that I or we really want to talk about. Sometimes an idea of, has come out of a conversation that we've had with a guest and we think, gosh, we want to explore this more. So it's really a great uh, place where we can just go deeper on some issues between the two of us that have just either come from a guest or just, you know, come from a thought we've had. Right. And the, the, those three kinds of shows – um, if we back up to the first kind of show, there's also, that's why I call it a three by three, right? There's three kinds of shows. And in the first kind of show, we've sort of identified, generally speaking, that there are three kinds of crucibles. In those crucible shows, we generally, big picture, big tent, um, there are folks who have had physical crucibles. 
They've had injuries, they've had illnesses, they've had something that has limited them, challenged them physically. That's the first of the three kinds of crucibles. There are folks who've had emotional crucibles, and a lot of our guests have been there, um, uh, who've you know, struggled with something that uh, happened to them, something that maybe they caused to happen, um, but it, it's, it's more emotional than it is physical. And then there's professional crucibles, those things that are uh, failures and setbacks in the workplace. And, and many times, and we'll discover that as we go through and we start to begin to unpack here in a little bit, some of the guests that have really stood out to us, many times there's overlap, right? These aren't rigid everybody's in kind of an iron box, right? There's a lot of overlap between the physical crucibles, the emotional crucibles, and the professional crucibles. Yeah, I mean, that, that's so true, because very often, I'd say almost always, folks that have had a, a physical crucibles, and we'll discuss this in a minute, uh, they can't always uh, change the physical side, but the emotional side is also devastating. Coming to grips with, um, as one of our, guests uh, or a number of them talk about a new normal is, you know, how do you, how do you um, emotionally recover? That's as big a part also uh, for those with physical, so physical, emotional, even those with professional, very often professional crucibles have to do with identity. Who am I? You know, do I have my identity just in my career? Uh, so, there is a lot of, there is overlap between these three. I mean, there's the primary crucible, which is how we've sort of uh, chosen to separate it, which makes sense, but there is overlap between the three categories. There is no, there's no question. Absolutely. And speaking of that, listener, thank you for uh, listening to our wind up here, for paying attention as we've sort of, uh, uh, in the baseball metaphor sense, we've, we've wound up for the pitch because now we're about to, um, to really pivot into talking about some of those shows, some of those guests and some of those conversations that have really stood out. And that's been the fun part about planning for this 50th episode is going back and reviewing the content that we've created. And we're going to start talking about physical crucibles, those things that uh, it, in many cases can be the most dramatic um, right? Because you're talking about um, a life that is, is restricted, is changed, is, as we say a lot, the trajectory is changed because of a physical illness, ailment, injury, something uh, along those lines. And the, um, uh, the first person, the first guest that we're going to talk about um, in that physical crucible perspective is uh, a young woman named Michelle Quay. Um, and Michelle's story, just a brief uh, setup, is that she was in a tragic car accident when she was 11 in Taiwan, where she grew up. And it, what happened to her is that it left her with physical and emotional scars that, that, that she's dealt with that plagued her for 30 years, but her body stopped growing after the crash. And that made her really get consumed by this idea that she was not normal. She was in her 30s, still the height she was, still the body size and type she was when she was 11. And that caused a whole bunch of pain and fear and, and retreating from life a little bit. And it was only when she took up hiking um, that she ended up beginning to burst through that. A 30-year journey, but she took up hiking and that ended with her, you'll remember this well, Warwick, she ascended Machu Picchu and that was when she learned that she wasn't just normal, which was her goal all her life. She just wanted to be normal. She realized, nope, I'm not just normal, but that she had extraordinary in her. That episode to me stands out as one of the most... Uh, revealing and inspiring that we've had yeah there's no question um she is probably one of the most inspirational guests that we've had because there's the contrast with the pain physical and emotional and her countenance now which is so full of joy and she's all about empowering people 
And she has her own coaching, Elevate Life Coaching, where she tries to help people discover their strength and inner beauty and overcome the fear of judgment um, and, you know, internal negative self-talk. But what is amazing is this has been decades in the making where she right. is. This is not like a, uh, so a, a really important lesson for listeners is, you know, don't expect to bounce back overnight or even in a year or two years necessarily. It can be painful. Now, the, the physical, um, I don't know that that changed that much after her accident. Um, she is four foot something. She has crutches. When she goes to the grocery store, she can't reach things on the top shelves. She has to use a crutch to kind of knock it off or have a, hopefully a good Samaritan help her out. Right. It's just, just tedious. I mean, you know, that's not something you don't do that often. It's just frustrating. But you're right, that whole Machu Picchu yeah. uh, episode. I think we have it, uh, it's, I don't know if it's seven, eight minutes on YouTube. Yeah. We have, it's really well worth listeners having a look at. Just that scene and it's, you know, this Inca uh, town at the top of this uh, mountain in Peru. And the trail is very steep and there she is in her crutches. And the last part of that journey is like 50 steps really steep and she's climbing up. She can't use her crutches because she just has to crawl on her hands and knees. And she's got a whole team with her, people that she didn't know uh, before, but they're just cheering her, you know, Michelle, Michelle. It's right. Kind of like Team Michelle, right? Well, actually, right. that's what they called it afterwards. Yep. So, yeah, just her whole countenance now. And she's written a book, Perfectly Normal. And so there was a time in which she felt bad about herself, that she, she felt like she wasn't pretty like the other young girls when she was growing up and, you know, dating and all of that. I mean, friendships, so much felt like it just wasn't easy anymore. But now she just has this incredible countenance of, of joy and wanting to empower yep. people. And, um, yeah, she is really inspirational and it's the physical was hard but the emotional that's been a lifelong journey to try to combat correct and i i've been blessed since that episode it was our 19th episode so um i'm not going to do the math because i'm bad at math but um i've been blessed since then to to become friends with her uh, you know and and we'll we'll talk you know semi-frequently in email and text and um, you know, she sent me a great Thanksgiving card that was just so sweet and so kind. And one of the things that she said in that episode that, um, that continues to stick in my mind, she said this, each and every one of us is a gift to this world. And when she came and she realized that, that was really when um, it all started to fall together after those 30 years of, of what was kind of an emotional, physical wilderness for her. And what she was able to do, the, the, the moment where she realized that, is that she realized that this is how I am and this is who I am. This is how she realized, this is how she was going to look for the rest of her life. Uh, she can accept this is how she's going to look and she can embrace every part of herself because there's something else other than what we see on the outside. In order to overcome your emotional challenge, Many times you have to be able to recognize it. You have to mm -hmm. allow it. You have to accept it. And my, my, my condition, my physical challenge was something I needed to accept. This is how I am. And this is who I am. This is how I'm going to look for the rest of my life. I can sit here and not accept it and keep having resistance, keep having that fighting emotion and keep wanting to understand why it has it done to me and, and keep wanting, exploring in that victim thinking uh, mentality or mindset. Or I can accept that this had happened. It, it's not, it's very unfortunate, but it happened. I can accept this is how I look and I can embrace every part of me because there's something else other than greater than what we see on the outside. It's not just the physical appearance. It's not just what we see externally. It's what's going on in the inside. There's a light that's inside each one of us. That's what we need to accept. How beautiful is that? Oh, it is. I mean, speaking of beauty, you know, really, she has this incredible inner beauty. Her soul is just radiant. It's just remarkable. And people know the challenges that she's been through 
physically, and because she has so much joy, it gives other people hope. It's like, how does she do this? How can she be so joyful? How can she accept who she is and what she's been through? But, but she has in, 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 you know, in so many ways. And so that's, yeah, it's really, I mean, she has this inner light that really shines brightly and elevates and uplifts everybody she comes in contact with. She is a true inspiration. Yeah, her energy, her optimism, her, I, you know, I'm friends with her on Facebook and her energy and optimism that she does with her community and just her friends is so infectious. You cannot, you can be in a bad mood, hop on Facebook, see something that Michelle Quay's posted and you're like, okay, I'm not in such a bad mood anymore <laughs> because she just got so much positive energy and so much hope. She offers so much, so much hope. And that is also the story of another physical crucible guest that we've had on offering hope. Uh, and that's really what, what, what we try to do with all of our guests is, uh, who've had crucibles. What, how, how did they find hope? And Ryan Campbell is another, uh, is another young person, um, a man in his 20s, who uh, went through a, 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 a horrific um, physical crucible and has emerged on the other side, um, encouraging people, offering hope, inspiration to them. And he is, you mentioned it uh, early on, Warwick, you mentioned that we had people from lots of different, you know, um, nationality backgrounds. I, we kind of have a, uh, more than, I think Australians number one among the, the, the backgrounds we've had. And Ryan is a, is a young man from Australia. So I don't know if that's coincidence or you're yeah, all I Australian. wonder how that happened. Who knew? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but Ryan's story, uh, so fascinating and so inspiring. He became the youngest pilot to fly solo around the world. Um, but then two years later, he's living his vision. He wanted to be a pilot since he was a little boy. He's living his vision. And then two years later, he was in a plane crash, a horrific plane crash that threatened more than the dream that he started at age six. Um, he was left a paraplegic after that accident. Um, but he fought, back, he fought back physically and emotionally to walk and to hope again. And most importantly, from a life of significance perspective to help others hope again. We started the airplane. Uh, you actually have to grab the propeller and spin the propeller with your hands and start it by hand. So it's a very old technology. And we taxied to the end of the runway. We lined up on this short grass airstrip nice and early in the morning to take off and go and look at the beach. And I pushed a power forward. The airplane performed beautifully and we lifted off the ground. The runway end, uh, the fence at the end of the runway disappeared beneath the nose and straight away at about 150 feet over the top of trees, the engine failed. And we had a partial engine failure. And within three seconds, despite everything that I could do, we just, we had no, I don't know what I ever could have done different. We had nowhere to go. And we ended up in what was a horrific plane crash. And you, it's just not explainable how bad it was. And I was cut from the wreckage placed into a, he a helicopter and flying to hospital, but I was the only survivor. That story also was one uh, truly inspiring from the start to the finish. Absolutely. I mean, his was almost not quite a double crucible, but he has two huge stories. Here he is at 19, growing up in Australia and just has this dream of flying. He's wanted to do that since he was a kid and had this idea that he could fly around the world and wanted to be the youngest, which he, uh, which he did. And just that whole journey, getting funding. Uh, I remember he wrote a letter to Dick Smith, who's this sort of maverick entrepreneur, kind of owns the equivalent of Best Buy in Australia and has supported right. a whole bunch of different adventures, including somebody who recently had on the podcast, which was so recent, was, you know, didn't, didn't make the, the 50 episode a conversation. Uh, Lisa Blair sailed around the Antarctic, which is a whole nother incredible uh, uh, adventure which is absolutely and she thing. also is from where <laughs> australia exactly <laughs> of course australians are so adventurous i guess but um, <laughs> but yeah so here's ryan he, he accomplished this amazing feat really put himself out there and then he just had this idea that he loved 
flying vintage airplanes that are biplanes, yet 20s, 30s kind of, uh, 20s, 30s planes and he had somebody with him you know he, helping them give joy rides as a whole people want to go up in planes like this and it was just this incredible bad luck really that he's a very accomplished pilot he's in this old plane and somehow the engine cut out and as he puts it if the engine had cut out 20 seconds early or 20 seconds later he would have been fine he could have you know either not taken off or he could have glided down but he was over trees and there's nothing he could do uh, and it wasn't his fault, but the, the passenger that was in that plane died. Yep. So not only did he have physical challenges, he had to accept the fact that the a person that he was, was in his plane died. Objectively, he knew it wasn't his fault. There's nothing he could do. Uh, there wasn't, you know, it's an old plane. Things happen. But um, he had to, uh, the physical I mean, he can walk now, but as he puts it somewhat uh, humorously, he kind of walks like he's had a bottle of Jack Daniels, I think is how he, how he <laughs> yes. expresses it. Yes. So, you know, it looks like he's uh, had a few too many. Um, and so he's, he's still not uh, 100%, so to speak, but he's functional. And he just talks about having a mindset toolbox to overcome crucibles. And his whole way back of, you know, feeling sorry for himself in hospital and looking out at somebody else in the rehab clinic who is just trying to move one little finger, just like a little bit. Right. And he's thinking, I'm feeling bad about myself. I can do more than move a finger. And this guy I think, is looking at me, like looking through my soul saying, or as we say in this trade, Hey mate, you know, what are you complaining about? Now he didn't say that, but right. the look said everything. Right. And Ryan knew what that look meant. It's like, okay, good point. <laughs> you know, it's not great, but I'm not where this other guy is. So his ability to bounce back from that somewhat physically, but especially emotionally. And he still, you know, enjoys um, flying. He tried to fly a helicopter, which is one road a bit too far, but at least he can fly. His, his whole attitude of hope, similar in one sense to Michelle Quay, he has this hope, this sense of optimism, despite what he went through. Yeah. And what you just said, Warwick, about um, him comparing himself to that other uh, gentleman in the hospital with him reminded me of another physical crucible guest that we had. It was actually two guests. It was a father and son, both of whom were uh, former Navy SEALs. And I remember that it was Mike and David Charbonnet are the guests. They were our fifth show very early on. And um, uh, quick rundown of their story. Um, David Charbonnet was the son who followed in his dad, Mike's footsteps, joined the SEALs, and then uh, he was hurt in a, par in a parachuting accident, and he was paralyzed. Um, and while he was telling that story, Warwick, I, I, don't even, I, 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 I don't know if you remember, but while he was telling that story, you were telling your story, and I was trying to make a point about how no matter where you, you know, your crucibles can be... Uh, similar, even if the circumstances are different, the emotions are often the same. And you made an offhand comment that your crucible certainly wasn't as devastating, or I forget the words you used, as, as David Charbonnet's might have been. And Mike, his dad, stopped you and said, you know, we should never compare our crucibles, never compare our pain, because what's the most painful for you is the most painful for you. So the idea that um, uh, the flip side to, to what, what um, Ryan did was to say, oh, geez, I don't have as bad that, as that guy. The idea of saying, um, uh, still knowing that your crucible, your pain is, is your pain and not to just dismiss it, to, uh, to live through it, to, to, to accept it like Michelle did, to take it, to realize it's there, to accept it and then move on, I think is an important bit of what we've been able to draw out of guests as we've talked to them. No, that's so true. I mean, it was inspirational what Mike Charbonnet sh shared that, you know, your pain, your crucible is, you know, you can't compare it as every bit as painful. And um, that was a remarkable episode because you had both father and son Navy SEALs yeah, you know, Mike thought about his son, that his son was objectively maybe could have been one of the best SEALs ever. And, you know, as a Navy SEAL, you don't make those comments idly. And so that was Mike's perspective. 
and to see his son just paralyzed and the, his career dream gone w- was tough. And it, it was obviously tough for the son, but, you know, physically there was only limited ability to, um, to overcome that. But he's now uh, heading up a, uh, a vet uh, rehabil- rehabilitation clinic in San Diego and sort of latest technology to help vets have the, the you know, best movement they can. And so again, you know, using his pain for a purpose and, that's also inspirational. Uh, David Charbonnet could have given up on life and felt very angry and bitter. Right. But he, he, he didn't. He just, he, he's using his pain to help others and help other vets. And yeah, I applaud him for his life and how he approaches it. He is living a life of significance. And another guest that, that I think of when we talk about this subject of physical crucibles is a, is a man named Tim Haig. And Tim um, is one of the few people, it's very rare, uh, who was diagnosed with early onset Parkinson's disease. And Tim was a nurse. So he kind of knew it was coming even before, like he, he felt the tremors and he felt some things and he knew that's what it was. And the diagnosis was confirmed. And, um, you know, he was, a, he was, he was 46. He was, a, he was active and he was vibrant. And suddenly this disease began to, to attack his body and, um, and slow him down and make it hard for him to do things that he had taken for granted. And um, one of the things he said at the end of that show that I think was so inspirational was he had to believe there was something good in it for him as he processed early onset Parkinson's. He, He said he had to believe there was something good in it for him. Otherwise it doesn't make any sense. He had to, he, what he was saying was, the lessons of this crucible, I have to learn them and apply them because that will be good for me. And then by extension, good for others, helping others. Yeah, Tim Haig was also incredibly inspira- inspirational. He's a person of faith, a Canadian. Um, and because he's been a nurse for a very long time, as soon as he started feeling that tremor in his left toe, he knew, as you say, he knew immediately what that was. Parkinson didn't need to go to the doctor obviously did got the whole tests and started a simple process of figuring that out but obviously you know you're going to be angry frustrated it's like really 46 I mean that hardly ever happens to right. somebody so young and but you know he did not let it destroy him I mean and you know he knows all the data he knows you know the act of Michael J Fox's help raise millions, if not billions, for research into Parkinson's that so far has not really found a cure. I mean, in his perspective, it's not, you know, through all the best will in the world, hasn't accomplished that much objectively. Not that there hasn't been a huge amount of effort, but there's not been much forward progress in significantly finding a cure. But yet he has turned his um, challenge uh, and he's not let it get him down. He won the Amazing Race Canada, which... right. You know him and his son. Awesome. How is that possible to with Parkinson's and that kind of disability to win? I mean, that was a miracle. That's a whole other story worth listening to the podcast for more details. But he now helps other Parkinson's uh, people with Parkinson's disease. And while there is no cure, with the proper diet, exercise, and mindset, you can be uh, more functional. You can have a significant. Uh, difference in your functionality, which I didn't realize. Right. And so he is really helping a lot of folks with Parkinson have uh, the best quality of life that they can. So again, a, a real inspirational, inspirational figure. I don't sense he's, he's, he's not happy that he has Parkinson's, right. but it's not destroying him. He's not like in a, in a well of, uh, of bitterness that's eating away like acid at his, at his soul every day. He's, that's not him. Right. Really an inspiration. He's a young man, Tim Haig, a, a young man with an, with an older person's ailment, disease. And this leads me to, uh, to, to segue into our next area, which is emotional crucibles, because uh, among all of the emotional crucibles we talked about, when I think of young man and doing something that you tend to only think happens to folks who are a li- have a little bit more tread off the tires, I think of a dome of Pia. Uh, a dome is a 16-year-old young man uh, who 
is one of the most remarkable people we've talked to because his perspective on things, his maturity in dealing with his crucible, uh, his crucibles and his perspective on how to come back from that is so far beyond his years. I've never heard you in an interview, Warwick, say, wow, or uh, just be like blown away by what a guest says more than I heard you in that interview with a dome. And it all started for him when you know, he grew up in eighth grade. Uh, he finally, after dreaming for years, he wanted to be in the National Spelling Bee. But he got knocked out of the National Spelling Bee early. Here, he, this thing that he's dreamt of, for maybe half his life or a third of his life, because he's only, you know, in eighth grade at the time, he's dreamt about it, he's studied for it, he's done all of these things, but he got knocked out early. Now, how many people who in eighth grade, how many young people, I can, I'll raise my hand and say, when I was in eighth grade, if I got knocked off of something I wanted really badly, I wasn't going to do what a what Adoma Pia did. Adom didn't feel sorry for himself. He didn't have a fit. He didn't uh, sulk. He didn't blow up. He turned his attention into consoling the other kids who'd also fallen short. He reached out and helped those who also had their dreams, their young dreams, kind of crushed by that experience. Um, and that just started a series of events in his life that has led him now at age 16. He's the author of two books and the founder of a, uh, a very successful fundraising nonprofit called Ball for Good. He's already at age 16 living a life of significance uh, that is focused on building a legacy of service to others. And that is impressive at any age. Um, superlatively impressive at 16. Absolutely, Gary. I mean, Adam is, you know, one of the most inspirational guests we've had because the amount of wisdom he has for his age, I'd say the amount of wisdom he has for any age was just mind-blowing. It's a combination of wisdom and maturity. I mean, right. it's just, um, here he is at, um, you know, at, at a young age, eighth grade, you know, this whole spelling bee thing, it wasn't just a whim. He'd been dreaming of this for like a couple of years or so. I mean, this was right. something he was a goal, a dream. He was passionate about. He worked hard. And just to, you know, all you have to do on that spelling bee is miss one word and that's it. And yeah, he was frustrated. You know, it wasn't like he didn't feel those emotions, but it didn't take long, as you say, for him to shift his thinking to console the other kids. I mean, what kid does that? I think right. he was still in middle school at that time. I guess the eighth grade he would have been. I mean, it's just, it's just stunning. And as you say, he writes two books, Bouncing Back from Failure, and then Kids Can Change the World. I mean, who, how many people do you know have written two books before they've even finished high school? Right. I mean, and it's just, it's just absolutely staggering. And, you know, one of the things that's um, – and as you say, he started this whole uh, – nonprofit ball for good. He's got a lot of very wise people on the board and he's done everything the right way to, you know, get the right. smartest people. But, you know, he is so mature. And, you know, when you ask him, somehow the word legacy came up and I was yeah, almost he said, embarrassed to ask him about it. Right. What happened was he was talking about how his dad always had told him the importance of just doing you is the way that he put it. And that what you need to do to make your legacy one you can be proud of. And he said, this is what he said about his legacy. I just want to be able to help definitely more people than I've helped now. My dad always tells me the importance of uh, just doing you and doing what you need to do, what your legacy should be. And so he's kind of taught me how I should listen to others, how I should take into account what everybody has to say and then pick well, what I believe to be important and kind of ingrain that in my life. Another amazing word I don't think I've heard pretty much any 16-year-olds mention is legacy. <laughs> you know, what do you want your legacy to be? That's something people think about on their deathbed. It's, it's typically, man, you know, I made lots of money or whatever happened and, oops, you know, I neglected my family. I was so driven, you know, whether it's in any field of endeavor business, sports, the arts, 
But you're thinking about legacy right now. I mean, do you have any inklings of what you want your legacy to be? It's probably a, a massive question, but since you brought up the word. I bet you do. I bet you do. <laughs> <laughs> I have some, some uh, broad aspirations as to, uh, I just want to be able to help kind of, I'm definitely more people than I've helped now. I want to be able to get to a point where I can consider myself a true philanthropist and be able to uh, allow people to benefit, be able to help with uh, the issues of the world in whatever way I can, whether that's in leadership or in financial contributions. I just want to be able to say at the end of my life that I was able to make a difference. I was able to help. For any young man who's 16 to already have helped people at the extent Adam has helped people by getting through ball for good, a professional basketball player, Zion Williamson, to be part of, of the celebrity basketball team. He wants to be able to get to a point where I can consider myself a true philanthropist. Um, I mean, that's amazing. It, it really is. And I mean, I don't, not everybody thinks about legacy, but very few folks in high school think about legacy. It's just too soon. They're thinking about getting through high school, perhaps Girls, college, boys. yeah, right. a job, you know, legacy. But you know, the I guess legacy ultimately, I guess, is defined when you're on your deathbed. What do you want your legacy to be? He thought about that, as you say, he wants to be thought of as a, as a ph philanthropist, and he said that at the end of his life, he wants to be able to say that he was able to make a difference. I mean, he, he knows what it is. He's not defined by how big that is. I think, you know, not so many words. He realizes just changing one life is enough. He just has such a mature perspective. He already has a handle on what legacy means and what he wants his to be. I can't think of anybody else his age who is that mature and that thoughtful and is even thinking about legacy, let alone have a very well thought out perspective on it. I mean, just... That's why it was so amazing. His maturity and his wisdom was off the charts. It was mind-blowing. It was just hard to believe. It's just, and for, yeah. him, for him to be able to deal with that emotional crucible of, and we discovered this with a number of guests, sometimes the most emotional, the, the hardest crucibles, the trials and tragedies of their lives happen very early. We have had other guests who didn't get on the basketball team when they were growing up. And that was a, you know, in eighth grade and it still haunts them. It still was an issue that they had a, a sticking point that they had to get over. Um, for, for that crucible that a dome went through at that age to lead him, not five years down the road to realize, aha, I need to help people. He realized within minutes, rather than going back to his room at the hotel for the, the spelling bee and sulking, he started helping other kids. And he's continuing to do that. That is inspirational. That is a, a pointer to everybody who goes through a crucible of any type, particularly an, an emotional crucible, that you can move beyond your emotional crucible one of the first things you can do is help others, right? What's the best way to stop thinking about your own problems? Go focus your attention on helping somebody with their problems. And the, um, another guest who as a young man, as a young boy um, who we had, who uh, dealt with uh, an extraordinarily difficult emotional um, crucible, was Jim Daly. And um, Jim Daly is the president of uh, the nonprofit ministry, Focus on the Family. And I, full disclosure, um, I used to work for Jim. I, I'm a friend of Jim's. And um, I used to say about the kind of man Jim Daly is, about the kind of man that Jim Daly, the kind of leader Jim Daly is, I would tell people that I would follow Jim Daly into a burning building simply because he told me to. He asked me to. Um, I wouldn't need to know why we were going into the burning building. I would know because I know his character, because I know his dedication to helping families. I would follow him into that building because I knew I would know that his reason for going in was a good selfless one focused on helping others. But what Jim unpacked for us when we talked to him, his emotional crucible, um, incredible that he leads this uh, global nonprofit organization that helps keep families together, helps families thrive, given what his own background was like. Abandoned by his alcoholic father at five, he lost his mother to cancer four years later and had no one to turn to but his four older siblings. He 
found, uh, spent time in foster care where he dealt with what he called unreal, uh, a family named the real family. Uh, Jim names them. They're the real family. And he said, they're actually the unreal family. He went through so much loneliness and so much pain and so much dejection. And yet he pushed through it and he perhaps not in minutes like a dome did, but it took a period of time. Um, he also found himself in a position where he wanted to help other people. And that's what he's doing today as the head of Focus on the Family. Yeah, I mean, people have, uh, a number of people have heard of Jim Daly, you know, the kind of CEO of uh, Focus on the Family that has a worldwide ministry, uh, faith-based, does a lot of good for, uh, for families. But they don't always know the backstory, which, you know, obviously working with him, you knew, but, but I didn't. And just, you know, being um, abandoned, you know, had an alcoholic father, mother dies of cancer. On the day of his mother's funeral, his stepfather just walks out on him and his siblings. I think he was the youngest. I mean, it's just, you know, he's just abandoned. And then you think maybe there's hope in foster care and it, it really – it wasn't very good. Um, <clears throat> so he had a really tough life, but somehow he didn't let that destroy him. He, I think, first maybe positive influence, I think was a, a football coach of his right. in yep. high school. Yep. And that, you know, to have a, a positive role model uh, in a male figure was something he hadn't experienced. Somehow there was a turn in his life and ended up going to college and, um, working in a, you know, working his way up in the corporate world before the opportunity came to come to focus on the family. But, you know, he had about as tough an upbringing as anybody I know. Yeah. It was really, really grim. And in our conversation, he offered, um, I think, a great piece of advice to people um, who have children about if they're going through difficult times, what do you do? One piece of advice I have for people is if, if you're going through difficulty as a parent, uh, let your kids in on it in an age-appropriate way. For me, I had to go from having a normal dysfunctional family to all of a sudden learning one Saturday morning that my mom had died the night before. And it wasn't expected. I wasn't anticipating it. I couldn't read the signs and put it all together. So it was a jolt to me to learn that the person who was the most loving kind person in my life all of a sudden was gone i didn't even have a chance to say goodbye to her i mean that is really good advice isn't it absolutely i mean he didn't have a really a positive role model of people doing that to him you know his stepdad saying hey your mom has died let's talk about this nobody not only did they not have a conversation they just left you know right. so it was as bad as it could be so obviously with his own kids his you know, his being more open, you know, there is an age appropriate way to talk about challenges you're going through, but just um, uh, not talking about challenges with your kids. It is just um, not helpful. I think psychologists would tell us, you know, kids want to be told something. You, you can't tell them nothing, right. but I mean, his remarkable to me is one of the most remarkable things about his story is he's not a bitter, vindictive or angry man. He could have been. No. He could have been angry at his alcoholic dad, at his right. dad, at his foster family, but he's not. He right. does not. I mean, doesn't mean that he condones. And we talk about that quite a bit um, beyond the crucible. Forgiveness doesn't mean you condone uh, poor or abhorrent behavior. But he keeps moving forward. And I asked him about that, and I can't remember his exact words, but it was something that changed. Well, you just move forward. You know, you, you don't let that get you down. He's somebody that. He's, I'm sure, reflective, but he doesn't reflect about all the pain. He keeps moving forward and trying to help others. He's, he's, fo he's forward focused. Right. Um, and, focused on helping others. And one of the things, that was episode 13, listener, so you can go back and you can hear it. Because one of the things I did, I remember now as we talk about it, one of the things I did in that show is I, 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 draw, I drew everyone's attention to the fact that even as he was talking about these really traumatic things, there was a joy to him about the other side of those traumatic things. In other words, he wasn't overjoyed that his mother had passed away. He wasn't overjoyed that he was abandoned or that he had trouble in foster care. But the lessons he learned from that and then how he applied those lessons in his life as the head of, of Focus on the Family, um, there was joy in his voice. He laughed. I mean, 
there are few people I've met in my life, let alone worked for, who laugh as much as Jim Daly and as robustly as Jim Daly. And that's an important thing, that authenticity of who he is, that finding the joy in the difficult moments of your life is it, it, it is. extraordinarily and important. I think for him, and we talk about this also quite a lot in Beyond the Crucible, is you know, in order to bounce back, you've got to, you, you've got to have some core of um, beliefs, values, something in, in a core. For him, he's a very strong man of faith, mm-hmm. faith in Christ. That's probably one of the cornerstones of him. But, you know, wherever you get it from, you've got to have some internal core of convictions and belief that can help fuel your, uh, your path back, that can, in his, from his perspective, help, uh, help him forgive. Um, so he's got this joy, but there's an anchor in his soul right. that fuels his joy, I guess right. is and, the point. So and find, that goes, find your anchor, whatever that may be. Right. There Everybody you go. has to find their own, but you've got to have one. Right. One of the big principles of crucible leadership, for sure. A couple other guests, Warwick, that we've had on, uh, again, who really struck me, um, who have gone through emotional crucibles. One of them was Sarah Nan. And, um, and the, the title that we put on Sarah's episode was just simply lean into your pain. And uh, her story um, was that her husband, she was a, she was a, a, a military, um, not just a military wife, but an officer. And her husband was a, was, a, was a military pilot and he died in a training accident. And she went through some, some difficult crucibles. But again, as she talked about how she came out of those, there was joy in her voice, but it was not easy um, for, and, and it was kind of double crucibles for her as well, wasn't it? It was. I mean, she had four children under six, the youngest just a few months old, when you see in the movies, you see those two uh, military folks coming up your driveway. Right. And as soon as she saw them, just like in the movie, she knew exactly what it was about. They were going to tell her that you know, she's a naval officer and they were going to tell her that her husband, uh, a fighter pilot, was killed in a training accident. And obviously, you know, she goes through incredible grief. I mean, she loses her husband. She's got young kids. How is she going to survive this? But she is one tough person in the, the best sense of that word. She is a survivor. And part of, obviously, how do you move on from something like that? I mean, it takes years. But, but the other crucible was, as she puts it, people put her in a widow box. Right. They expected her to be this grieving widow for the rest of her life. Because if, they, if she really wanted to honor her kind of military hero pilot, she should put her life on hold and permanently grieve, permanently weep, not move on, not find another relationship. Nobody would probably ever say that to her. It was a look in their eyes. It was almost the expectations. People mean well, but she was not going to be in that widow box. So, you know, she has moved on in, in her life and relationships. And, you know, she really has a mission to help other widows, whether it be through, you know, military widows or widows uh, from, other, uh, from other causes, not just be put in that box and move on. It's not just possible that she puts it to overcome that kind of crucible. It's possible to thrive. Right. For some, you use the T word thrive. It feels like if you're thriving, you must not have loved your husband. You mm-hmm. may not say that, but people think some very bad things, unfortunately. And she right. refuses to accept that. She doesn't apologize for, for thriving. That's not dishonoring a husband. So she also is a true inspiration. Yeah. Also inspirational. Uh, and uh, here I, I tend to know all of our uh, examples here in the emotional crucible category. Um, another uh, uh, friend of mine, Esther Fleece Allen. Um, she was our first guest, the first person who we ever interviewed on Beyond the Crucible. And Esther's story, which I uh, knew well, uh, but still learned some things in our conversation, um, Esther's story was that she had a traumatic childhood of abuse and abandonment, uh, and, but she rose above that. She moved beyond the crucible, and she uh, carved out a successful career as a speaker and writer, and we actually worked together for a spell. But then uh, the father that she feared, who had abandoned her when she was young, 
resurfaced in her life and stalked her. And she realized that the successful life she'd built was um, a bit of a defense mechanism to avoid processing her pain. And uh, she has focused herself now to lament on those crucible experiences, to feel them completely, to, to as the title of the Sarah Nannan episode says, lean into your pain. She learned, Esther Fleece Allen learned to lean into her pain. And from that, she's been set free of some of, uh, of the pain that she experienced that led her to kind of, um, uh, as she put it in her first book, to fake fine. Absolutely. I mean, Esther Fleece Allen, kind of like Sarah Nallen, she's a fighter. She's a survivor. I mean, truly, truly impressive. Uh, as you mentioned, you know, abandoned by her parents, later on father stalked her. I mean, in high school, what's amazing is she was like raised by parents of friends at a high school. Just, you know, she'd go from place to place. And I think she was getting like straight A's active right. in high school. I mean, how is that possible? And I asked her about that and says, well, I mean, she wasn't going to let this define her, destroy her. She was going to, she, she's one of these people that just, yeah, I guess they talk about fight or flight. She's absolutely on the, on the fight side. I'm not going to let this get me down. I'm just going for it. Right. But as she was doing all of that, that really led as, you know, better than I, her first book, No More Faking Fine. On the outside, she was seen to be this high achieving young woman. She's going for it, getting it done. But on the inside, there's still the pain that maybe she was, you know, pushing down. And so she realized she needed to deal with it. And I love her new book, Your New Name, which is really a faith, uh, obviously, uh, faith perspective, your new name from hers perspective, faith, you know, your new name in Jesus, so to speak. But it's almost like you're not defined by your, your narrative that you grew up with. You're not defined by the story of abandonment. You can chart your own course. You can have your own new name. So her ability to not just survive, but like Sarah Nannan to thrive and deal with the pain, the emotional pain, and just have this light and this joy um, is also truly remarkable. And it's hopefully, listeners, what you hear when you hear these stories of the way in which these individuals have bounced, not back from, through their crucibles. It, it, it maybe doesn't take just a couple of minutes like it did for Adoma Pia. Uh, sometimes it can take 30 years like it did for Michelle Quay, but there is light at the end of the tunnel. There is significance at the end of the pain. And that's what we've, uh, we've discovered through our first 49 episodes of Beyond the Crucible. And another guest, Warwick, as we switch now into professional crucibles, those, those things that happen to us in our working life, another guest who offers that, perspe- that, that example and perspective of light at the end of the tunnel, that perspective of, of moving beyond things that held you down uh, for a long period of time is Kathleen Merkel. Uh, Kathleen Merkel grew up in communist East, East uh, Germany, uh, and she was taught that her value came from doing what others expected of her, uh, working hard, not upsetting the established order of things. But then the Berlin Wall fell and freedom came, and she tentatively kind of stepped into that in ways that weren't always great for her. Um, she pursued professional goals and personal goals um, with a passion, but they didn't satisfy her in the way that she thought they would satisfy her. She had some issues with um, her staffs uh, and her bosses kind of told her some things that we don't like to hear from our bosses. And uh, it's kind of sent her reeling a little bit the, the, in her, in her early professional career and that professional kind of setback, that professional disruption led to some, some challenges for her. Yeah, I found Kathleen Merkel just a remarkable woman. Um, she's somebody that uh, is very driven. I mean, she grew up, as you mentioned, in communist East Germany and this sort of, um, you think, sort of German work ethic, kind of uh, go at it, uh, very driven. Uh, so she was in her 20s, 30s, just working her way up the corporate ladder, doing amazingly well. Um, uh, but it was kind of like 
I'm going to get this done, you know, no matter what. And she was kind of walking over people. She was almost, from her perspective, being too German. She was giving people feedback very directly, very bluntly. Right. Right. This isn't working. I need you to do this. You know, I mean, and, and she had her boss say to her, you know, you need to turn it down a bit. People don't like you. Now, you know, interestingly enough for her, her boss was a woman. So it wasn't like, oh, some male boss, you know, saying to some woman, oh, you know, you need to be more nice. Or, it was a woman telling her, right. you know. So that, that, you know, she couldn't really dismiss that. It's just somebody that just doesn't get it. Right. And so she really took that to heart. And there was sort of a couple of crucibles there. One is just how she hated feeling like people didn't, were scared of her and maybe, I don't know about didn't like, but certainly scared of her. She, nobody wants people to be scared of them who work right. for you. That's not good. But she realized she didn't have a life. I think she went on a, a trip with some folks um, to Indonesia. I think it might've been Bali, I believe. And she realized she had no life. It was all work. She had no social life, no vacation. No, everything was work. And, um, she came to a point in that trip when she realized she didn't know who she was. She was just this right. driven workaholic, if you will. Right. And there was a moment in that interview, Warwick, there's a, there a moment in that interview that it still impresses me so much about the way that you drew out of her what she was going through. And it impressed her too, because she actually, at some point, I think in the interview stopped and said, I'm going to write that down because some of the insights that we were discussing, she was like, oh, that's good. But she, she talks about um, uh, the importance of having friends around her. It wasn't just about work. So she packed herself up with friends and she kind of let her emotions out with them. And it led to an extraordinary turning point. Uh, where she said she started nourishing her body and her soul again. I started nourishing my body and my soul again. I had um, life coaching sessions. Um, I had nutrition sessions, uh, Ayurvedic. Um, that sounded very German, Ayurvedic um, <laughs> food and um, massages and all of these things. And I had um, a lot of meditation sessions and yoga. Um, but the most important thing was I have, was surrounded by kindness unconditional mm. kindness which i haven't really received a lot or i didn't quite know what that was and i started simply being myself and i remember when i left after three and a half weeks there um one of the guests said to me my goodness it's beautiful to see the real you and i was literally standing there in tears because i could feel those walls were gone i was just feeling so amazing about myself so did, did you feel like in that moment that for the first time you met Kathleen Merkel? Yes. You, that you didn't really know who she was? Like, so this is who I am. Who yeah. knew? Maybe yeah. I can smile. Maybe yes. I can <laughs> forgive myself if I make a mistake. It's like, that exactly. must have been a strange experience to meet yourself in a sense, the real you for the first time. It was strange and beautiful. I actually got goosebumps listening to you describing me. Um, <laughs> it's, it was just absolutely stunning. And I was crying because I was just so full of gratitude and joy about it. It felt, suddenly it felt like a rock fell off my shoulders and it felt light and easy and life started feeling just super easy. That for me is one of the, one of the most meaningful uh, moving exchanges we've had on the show. It really was, because I think a lot of people are there. They work hard, they're driven, especially in, you know, 20s, 30s, 40s, you're working your way up, you want to get the brass ring, you want to kind of be CEO, vice president, um, have a good life, none of which is wrong. But she was very driven, and she realized, you know, what is this all for? She was, you know, it's easy to get caught up in the uh, kind of conditional love. Oh, maybe people will like me or love me if I'm successful and that kind of mindset. And as she was in Bali, you know, with some friends, you know, they didn't know the corporate Kathy, the, cor the corporate Kathleen Merkel. She found, I think as she put it, the real Kathy. And she didn't know who that person was. She was meeting herself. And it's like this person can laugh, can have friends, can have fun. And, you know, she was enjoying herself. And it was just, you know, she realized it was okay to be Kathleen Merkel. 
you know, she didn't have to be Kathleen Merkel, you know, the corporate success, you know, watch out, she's coming because <laughs> she might snap your head off or something. Right. Um, and so that really changed her whole life. And so now she um, coaches and trains women leaders in particular to not just be successful, but have balance. And it's not just about you can be successful and work your way up the corporate ladder, but you can have balance and have joy. And that's really her mission, especially to give women leaders not just success, but joy and balance. And so that's a, a very important message. And her accountants now, it's full of joy. She's a very joyful person. Right. Yeah. yeah. She works hard. She's driven, but she's joyful. And that's an important message, I think, for all of us. And it's also the story, interestingly enough, of another guest we uh, had who had a who had a much different, a, a completely different um, kind of professional crucible. And that's one of the things I love about Beyond the Crucible in general, and about us taking time here um, for a fiftieth episode to to revisit some of the themes and some of the guests and some of the insight that they have, because there is no matter how different someone's crucibles are in detail in in execution the way they've affected you how you react to them and then how you overcome them there's just so much similarity uh across those lines and the guest i'm speaking of in this case is whitney singletary white um episode 42 listener if you want to check that one out uh whitney's story just fascinated me i found whitney uh, I did a Google search, I think, for, uh, you know, professional setback or something like that. And her name popped up in a story that was in the, uh, the, the uh, newspaper in Berkeley, California. And Whitney was, you know, she's at age three, she, she baked her first batch of cookies. And she used and she laughed as she told the story on the podcast. She uses her as one of her secret ingredients, mud. And her grandfather was so encouraging, he ate it and said, yeah, it's pretty good. It'd be even better if there wasn't any money, it'd end up good for you. Exactly. And that led her down the road to want to have a bakery. And she worked hard to make that happen to the point that she developed her, her own kind of cookies. She does, her, her business is called Nut and Butter Cookies, and that's because there's nothing but there's nuts they're all nut based cookies and she's got she talks on the show about all these different exotic kind of nuts that neither one of us ever heard of and it was great <laughs> but her professional crucible came when um first she got assaulted um while she was baking from her home in her apartment then that got resolved and she got a storefront and she was finally stepping out she was doing it but it was early 2020, the spring of 2020, and we all know what happened then. COVID-19 hit, and she had to shut down. And that led her to begin selling her cookies out of her driveway. And um, the pluck that she uh, demonstrated there was just, uh, was just amazing to me. And, and the spirit uh, boy, she's a, she's a formidable person for sure, isn't she? Absolutely. I mean, Whitney Singletary White is also an inspiration. I mean, she grew up in Bakersfield, California. I guess it's pretty hot, and she pretty much said there's not a whole lot to see there. And, you know, uh, she now <laughs> lives in, in Berkeley. And, uh, yeah, the story with her dad, that was a funny story when she's, you know, putting mud in the It was her grandpa, and, I think. I think yeah, it was exactly, her exactly, her grandpa. That was just so amazing. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's interesting. She's, uh, you know, for um, part of her life was a mom with two, uh, two small kids, a uh, single mom, and um, she just had this dream of cookies and of just every kind of nut cookie you can imagine. As you said, many of the nuts we'd never heard of. I think obviously, you know, pecan, but you know, sesame, I haven't really had sesame uh, cookies before, but um, she just had this dream and she wasn't going to give up. She also right. was very resilient. Mm -hmm. You know, she finally gets a, a store in, in Berkeley and then COVID hits. And not only do they have to close, I think the landlord uh, didn't want to let her, let her out of the lease. Right. He's like, right. Siri, and then he says, what can I do for you? Well, how about letting me out of my lease? <laughs> yeah. How about being a human being and letting yeah, me out of my lease? Yeah, which I'm not quite sure that ever got worked out. So then she's got to go back. 
selling cookies in, in or trying to sell cookies in her apartment building. And as you mentioned, she ends up getting beaten up from, uh, I think, the people across the road and, you know, aided by some of the folks in her uh, apartment building and badly beaten up. Right. Um, and then if, you know, things aren't any worse at some point during all of this, she gets a flu injection that was not done well and her arm was out of action for a long right. time. You can't bake without two arms. Right. She's had a lot of stuff, but yet, like some of our guests, she just has this, this grit. This, she does not give up. She, she has this um, ability to, um, to overcome. Right. And she said, one of, the, of all of the, the, the succinct expressions of what it takes to move beyond a crucible, of all the people who've said some things that are great takeaways for, for listeners to grab onto and hope through in their own crucibles. She said something that toward the end of that show, Warwick, that was, that was um, just so on point and so honest and transparent and real when she said that, you know, help help comes in the most unexpected places when you least expect it. At that moment, when you feel that you really can't go on, there is always going to be that one person that you wouldn't expect to do it will reach out and help you. And I find that you can't really fail if you don't keep trying. Because once you give up, you failed. You're done. That's over. But if you're long as you're like, I can still, I still got it. I can still make it. You can still get that little bit in there. You can still push through just enough. It's hard. It hurts. But once you get past that moment, you can sit back and go, I, I made it. I overcome that. I'm no longer feeling that pain anymore. I'm finally where I need to be. You can get yourself out of it. We've got to pull ourselves out of the mud sometimes and dust off the mud, walk through what was drying on and cracked up in her pants and flake it off and get going. It's just sometimes you just have to do it. <laughs> it is remarkable. When you're really going for it and you're not letting things get you down, uh, it is amazing. Like in the era of COVID, there was limitations on how much um, you can get from the store. Well, she bakes cookies, so she needs a whole bunch of flour, eggs, butter, you know, the whole deal. When it, they were rationed, but she had a bunch of friends saying, look, you know, I can get I can get some extra. I can afford to get a little bit extra, and I'll just drop it off. And all these people come out of the woodwork trying to help her. Right. Um, but it's like at the end of it's a wonderful life when everybody yeah. shows up and gives George Bailey money. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But her attitude is really remarkable. She has this phrase in which she says, um, "You can't really fail um, if you just keep if you just keep trying. If you don't give up." So she doesn't. She never gives up, and that's how she defines not failing is just keep trying. And, you know, there were times when it was bad, when she was really hurt and injured from being beaten up and a two little kids said, you know, it's okay, mommy, don't give up. And, you know, I guess she must have told the kids that a fair amount. And, you know, her ability um, in some very difficult circumstances just to keep going is just remarkable. She's even won over the local fire department and, uh, and, 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 police, and the police department. Police department. Yeah. I mean, they love her cookies so much as she puts it. She has, you know, free security. They just come by right. and says, hey, Whitney, everything okay? Do you need anything? You yeah. know? And They've like, traded, the police department has traded donuts for her cookies. Oh, Absolutely. yeah. Nobody's going to mess with her. <laughs> they they kind of know that she has friends in the right places. So, truly remarkable woman. And as we round out uh, discussion, uh, having discussions about the, the, the crucible guests that we've had on a couple other folks that we've talked to um, over the last year plus uh, who experienced professional crucibles come to mind uh, for me. One of them, Tommy Breedlove. Uh, Tommy Breedlove is a, uh, is a, is a, is a really uh, talk about a go-getter. Here's another go-getter. He was, um, he had some, some crucible moments, uh, physical and emotional uh, violence when he was he was young, but he he moved beyond that and he he was killing it in corporate America. He was the guy with the gold cufflinks, I think he says, or platinum or whatever precious metal they were made out of. And he was on the he wasn't just on the fast track; he was ahead of other people on the fast track. And yet, um, 
while his career was skyrocketing, his personal life wasn't doing as well. And he found himself one night, didn't know how he got there, but he was lying in a ditch in his native Atlanta. And he was trying to figure out how he got there, both physically and circumstantially. How did he end up there? And um, the way that he came back was uh, through what he calls learning how to live a legendary life. Yeah, Tony Breedlove is also a remarkable person. I mean, he grew up in a blue-collar neighborhood in Atlanta. Um, you know, it was not the easiest neighborhood. I mean, he, you know, now looks as him, at himself that he was a bully when he was a young age, which is, it's hard, that's a hard thing to live with. Nobody wants to be a bully, at least not when they've had some uh, more perspective. He ends up getting in prison. And somehow he bounces back from that. I think there was one individual, I think an African-American older man in prison that just kind of helped inspire him. And so he works at this financial services firm. And you're right, he was, as you see, he was killing it. He was doing really well. But he got to a point where it's like, is this all there is? And right. he told his boss, look, I'm, I'm going to resign. And he said, you're nuts. You're going to be part, you're going to make a staggering amount of money, an enormous amount of money. You give, you, do you know how much you're giving up? And he did. He says, well, basically said, my soul's not for sale. And he realized that there's more to life than just success. He believes in success, but from his perspective, a legendary life is more about living a life on purpose, thinking of others, balance, uh, self-love, as he puts it, which is really taking care of yourself. And uh, that's been a challenge for Tommy just because of how we grew up with you know, you can get into the, the the scenario where many are that, oh, if I'm successful, then maybe not only will other people love me, maybe maybe I can love myself. And somehow right. they feel like being successful, which it never really solves, or never right. really helps that. But he has a more balanced life. He genuinely loves himself in the healthy sense of that word. Uh, he speaks. He's, he's written a book, Legendary. Um, he has true friends. He's like a, in a council, if you will, to help him stay on the right track. And he, he is a, 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 a good life, a life on purpose, a legendary life. But yeah, he, he is an inspiration for those who are just going flat out in the corporate world. You can be successful, but you can be more than successful. As we say, you can be, have a life on purpose, a life of significance. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting that his, so many people that we've had on the show have asked various forms of that question that you pointed out that Tommy asked, and that is, is this all there is? So many people have, have achieved some goal, dream, whatever it was, um, but it wasn't as fulfilling as they maybe thought it was. I, I remember one guest, I forget who it was now. Um, it might've been, it might've been, um, uh, Kathleen Merkel, where I said, uh, you know, you reach for the brass ring and you realize it's lead. Um, mm. We've had folks who have experienced mm -hmm. that in a variety of different ways. And that's a, um, that's a, I think a, a resonant point that a lot of us can identify with is that what we think we want once we get it um, or uh, isn't exactly what we want. And sometimes the crucible can be quote unquote success itself. Yeah, there's the um, parable, if you will, of the anthill, uh, well, all these ants are kind of crawling up all over themselves and the ant hill to reach the top. And one ant says to the other ant, you know, what's up there? It says, I don't know, but everybody else is going for it. So it must be good. And, you know, it's only once you reach the top, it's like, is this all there is? But on the way up, you're just crawling all over yourself and all over others. It's, it's you know, success is fine, but success in of itself, which is a big theme beyond the crucible and crucible leadership doesn't satisfy. So certainly he is a testament to that. And the last professional crucible that we'll go over here um, is Robert Krantz. Bob Krantz is a uh, Hollywood filmmaker, actor, producer, writer. He's sort of like Alan Alda. If you remember when you watch the old MASH episodes, Alan Alda did everything. He acted, he wrote, produced, directed. Uh, Bob Krantz does that. And um, he uh, just a year ago produced a film called Faith, Hope, and Love. It's a dancing movie uh, with a woman um, um, whose name I can't pronounce. I believe her first name's Peter. I believe she's also, isn't she Australian? She as is, well? of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Um, we try uh, to get Australians into every episode if we I, can. That's even. fabulous. <laughs> I did not realize that. We need to do it. Episode 51 will be about all of the Australians we've had on the show. Um, but Bob Krantz did this movie, Faith, Hope, and Love. And I remember I was so impressed by it that I reached out to him to be on the show um, because his character in the movie – and it's semi-autobiographical, the movie, his character in the movie goes through some crucibles. And I figured, aha, Bob Krantz must have some crucibles. And indeed he did. But I, what I remember about that, Warwick, is I sent you a copy of the film or I arranged for him to send you a link to the film. And you told the story. I mean, tell folks how your like entire family, which is hard to do for an entire family, but they all loved it, right? They did. And yeah, I mean, I have two boys and a girl uh, in their twenties and it's hard to find, right. you know, the boys are like action movies, you know, my daughter more comedy, romantic comedies, you know, my tastes are pretty broad. Don't like horror, but anything else I'm pretty much good for. My wife has pretty broad tastes, but you know, this had, uh, there was a message of faith. Uh, there was dancing. It made you laugh. Um, there was a story of redemption. I mean, it, ha it had everything in there. It was so, you know, you laughed, you cried. It had everything in there. It was very inspirational. Um, it was a terrific movie, and uh, Netflix picked it up. I don't know, suddenly at one point, it was on like the trending movies on Netflix, right. or, you know, most popular. Yep. Um, and it, it was a really a terrific movie. And, his story, his professional crucible was early in his career as a uh, hyphenate, right? As a Hollywood hyphenate, writer, director, actor, producer. He wrote a film, again, a, a semi-autobiographical film. And it was, to his mind, it was, uh, and to the people that he showed it to in his circle, it was a fab fabulous movie. He had the backing of some some names in Hollywood. And he's all set up for a screening with some studio executives, which is the, which is the mother load in Hollywood. I worked in Hollywood. It's the mother load of Hollywood to get studio execs to come to your screening and to see your movie. And while he's doing that, something happens that's extremely crucible-esque. What happened? The projector uh, stopped. I think, you know, the, uh, the bulb uh, blew. A fact, bulb. I think he might have even asked the folks, okay, so you got spare ball. He might have even done that in advance. So, right. oh, yeah, we're, we're covered. We know what we're doing. And, of course, didn't have a spare. It just, it was horrendous. Yeah. And what happened when that, that crucible hit, his movie did not get picked up for distribution. And that led him, that and a personal crucible involving a, 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 a dangerous pregnancy that his wife and her uh, – who had triplets, uh, a very touch and go pregnancy that his wife had, the combination of those, those two things, his wife did indeed have the, have the triplets. And Bob decided, the professional crucible made it somewhat easier to make that decision, to stay and make sure he was present because he almost lost those three children. He wanted to be present with them. And he didn't make a movie for about a decade. So his professional crucible, which began when the bulb burned out, undone by a bulb, then some, some personal crucibles hit. He didn't make a movie. Faith, Hope, and Love was his first, his first movie in 10 years. That, again, is a story of sticking with it, having perseverance, and pursuing your vision in spite of what might come up, what life might throw at you in between. And it's also another story of just kind of anchoring your vision in your uh, values. He also is a person of faith. And for him, I, I, I think I remember him almost having this proverbial conversation with God. It's like, you know, if my kids survive, I'm going to be present. Like it was almost right. like a conscious decision. That's, that's right. And so, and he did. Now, he's a driven guy. And, you know, as you know better than I, in Hollywood, if you're going to make a movie, it's, you know, pedal to the metal, it's, you know, there's not a whole lot of spare time. You're at it. And so he probably would not have been present. So for somebody in Hollywood that loves making movies to take 10 years off uh, from making movies to sacrifice them for, for his kids is remarkable. I think they're uh, either in college or maybe out of college by now, but he has a great relationship with them because he was present. Another message is you can't sacrifice your soul. Um, it's sort of like that, song off and think of by cat stevens cats in the cradle right. you want to be that person when it's like oh yeah you know i'll be there soon son i mean you don't get those years back and so he made a choice 
And I, you know, if you have a belief in the Almighty, I feel like somebody up there honored that because Faith, Hope, and Love is a great movie, and he's doing. I think he's doing pretty well um, considering what he's been through. But that was a conscious choice. I'm not going to sacrifice my family. And it was a miracle that he had those three kids. The doctors multiple times said to his wife, you've got to terminate this because your right. life's in danger. Countless times she said, I am not doing that. That was her choice. Yep. I'm not doing that. And so he, he was going to honor his wife and honor his family, and he was not going to sacrifice them for some career goal. Right. And his life of significance has become those three boys, and now producing quality, values-laden entertainment that is not just for the choir. It's not just for the Christian choir. As you pointed out, not only was that movie, Faith, Hope, and Love, on Netflix and did well, but he signed a, uh, a, a two-year deal with Netflix to produce more content. So um, that is how he is, uh, how overcoming, moving beyond his crucible, he's led him to a life of significance. I love what we're going to talk about next, Warwick. And I, and I haven't told you why I love it because I just realized why I love <laughs> it. Why I love it. We're going to move now, uh, listeners, into the prospective guests that we've had on the show in our first 49 episodes uh, as we continue our discussion in our 50th episode of some of the highlights of Beyond the Crucible. Uh, the two folks who we're really going to spotlight here um, actually represent, I think, the, the, the things that you and I sort of love the most or really like the most in pursuits. We have one guest, right? Jeff Kemp, who's the former NFL quarterback, and I'm an enormous football fan. And we have another guest, Nancy Kane, who's a professor at Harvard Business School, which not only you graduated from, but she's a historian who writes about leadership and you love history and leadership. Absolutely. So um, uh, this should be a really fun one for us to go through. Jeff Kemp. Jeff Kemp, uh, interesting guy in that Jeff Kemp is a second-generation NFL quarterback. He was a second-generation NFL quarterback. His dad was Jack Kemp. Jack Kemp was a superstar in the old AFL, the American Football League. He was an MVP of that league for the Buffalo Bills. He won an AFL championship. He was uh, all-pro, the AFL's version of whatever all-pro, all-star team was at the time. He was distinguished as an NFL quarterback. His son, Jeff, uh, goes to Dartmouth, gets out, um, does not have the same story about his, his NFL career. Jeff Kemp does have an NFL career, but it does not match the distinguished career that his dad had on the field. Adding to what could have been pressure on Jeff Kemp is that his dad, Jack, listeners may remember, of a certain vintage. Listeners may remember that his dad, Jack Kemp, was a congressman uh, from, uh, from New York for a long time, was um, president, the first President Bush's um, Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, I believe, uh, and then was, uh, after that, Bob Dole's running mate for the presidency in the race against Bill Clinton, and they lost, but he was a presidential candidate who debated Al Gore. Uh, back in the early 90s. So this is a man who's, you know, your father is someone who's accomplished all this on the football field. You go into football, and then when he gets out of football, he accomplishes all of this other stuff. Jeff Kemp ended up as an NFL quarterback to be more of what we would call, what what some would call a journeyman. And he, he played for a number of different teams. He was never, in his 20 years from, you know, early, his early days of playing as a young man to when he left the NFL, of those 20 years, he was only a starter at the start of the season one time, he says, in our episode. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Jeff Kemp is an interesting guy. You know, it's funny. Um, I grew up in Australia, so obviously didn't play uh, American football, but I could relate to him in the sense that, as listeners know, I grew up in a prominent family. You know, my dad was knighted, in fact, my you know father, grandfather, great grandfather, all were knighted in their own right. My dad has the same name as me. He was Sawarik. You know, the founder of the, of the company was a great man. So you had generations of very prominent people that accomplished a lot and who were admired. Not just yeah, they were wealthy, but they were admired for who they right. were and what they did. So I could relate in a sense. And yeah, as you point out, you know, football star that his dad was. Um, 
congressman from, yeah, you mentioned Buffalo, New York, um, you know, housing and urban development secretary under George H.W. Bush, running mate with Dole, ran for president in 88. The guy was driven, and just to make matters almost worse for poor Jeff, everybody liked Jack Kemp. He was right. a good guy. He was driven. People on both sides of the aisle, they liked him. They admired him. The guy had a heart. He cared. Right. He was a, go a good and great man in the best sense of that word. And he always, he never, you know, purposely tried to push his kids. But he talked about being a Kemp, and that had some sort of iconic right. meaning. And he was almost overzealous in his support. And, you know, just a message for parents, don't overdo the cheerleading. Because <laughs> he'd be like, hey, Jeff, you did great. But, Dad, I sat on the bench in that NFL game. I did nothing. But you did it well. Okay, yeah. what's that mean? Yeah. Sitting and on you the look bench. great in warm-ups. Right. Yeah, I mean, really? Uh, so he kept cheering him. And so he didn't intentionally try to pressure his son. But it, obviously his son doesn't have nearly the football career that his dad did. And eventually, you know, he um, – you know, his run ends, and that was sort of depressing that he was let go, and um, uh, that was a tough thing to come back from. And he's written this book, Facing the Blitz, which, uh, you know, similar to, in one sense, Facing Crucibles. And he talks about, um, you know, how blitzes, they don't have to kind of uh, define you. And it's, right. it's sort of very interesting how his whole uh, concept there. Yeah, and, and one of the things about Jeff Kemp that was interesting is that all of the things that we talked about, about not, quote, unquote, measuring up in the eyes of some people to his dad, those could be really crucible experiences for people, but he didn't really take those uh, as deep crucibles. Um, you know, he never put, his dad never put pressure on himself. He put some pressure on himself himself, he said, but he got through that and he learned this idea of combating the blitz, which in football is when the entire defense runs after the quarterback and tries to bury him. Um, that's what crucibles feel like. And it, it was fascinating to hear you both talk about that. But we brought Jeff on because his perspective that he expresses in that book, Facing the Blitz, is really something that all listeners can can get some great insight and inspiration from. Every person out there has been blitzed. Right. They've been cut. They've been rejected. They went to junior high. They know what it's like to be on the losing end of that conditional performance-based value system, making fun of your pimples or your size or your voice or whatever. Um, everyone goes through crucibles. Yep. I want to remind people, you want to remind people, Gary wants to remind people, you are not alone. Others have been in it before. And the worst thing you can do is hide your emotions from other people, mm. hide your pain, drown it or, and self-medicate it or pretend it didn't happen. The, the worst thing you can do is say, I'm a victim. It's all about other people because you'll never grow if you don't look at what your part in it was, which it wasn't, I'm the worst guy in the world, I deserved to be benched, or I, mm -hmm. I, I deserve to have cartoons against me. No, but you know what? There's lessons that I learned. Um, and, and, and you have to accept your own personal responsibility. Maybe it was a divorce you went through. You've been thinking it was 90% her. Your math is probably off, <laughs> okay? Um, maybe you were cut or sacked or benched or fired by some company and you think that was the worst manager, the worst CEO ever. Maybe they weren't that perfect, but there might be something you can learn. Absolutely. So what I'm saying is embrace the crucible, embrace the blitz, get honest with God and honest with other people about it and learn everything you can about yourself and what life is truly about. Cause your life is not about your win loss record, your statistics, your bank account. Uh, the, the applause of the world, how many Twitter followers you have, that, that is pretty much a bunch of BS. And it'll take you down a wrong road. You'll lose your identity. Living for image and living to gain and earn your, your identity is a very losing equation. Yeah, it's really remarkable. I mean, you don't think of embrace the blitz or embrace your crucible. I mean, who thinks that way? But 
you know, I mean, in, in football terms, which I mean, I've lived here long enough to understand something about it, but, you know, um, you would know more, but you might have a play in your mind, but then you see all these people lined up and you can see the blitz is coming. Well, that play clearly probably won't work. So you need to change the play and be adaptive. And so he uses that as a metaphor for life that you might get blitzed and, you know, maybe his dream was to be an NFL star quarterback you know, Joe Montana or um, somebody like that who he actually played on the 49ers at one point when, uh, and uh, quarterback when Joe was injured. Well, he's, he's not going to be in the Hall of Fame like Joe Montana, but he, ha- he changed his, his vision is now different. He now uh, obviously is an author, speaker. He spent a lot of time um, in, you know, also a person of faith and working with families and parents and men just in terms of uh, how you face blitzes, how you overcome them, uh, how you be good parents. So he has a passion for what he does now. And so his, his vision has really changed from just being an NFL quarterback. He has his own vision and he's also somebody with tremendous joy. And you don't feel like those expectations are on him anymore. You feel like he's at peace with who he is, what he achieved, and what he didn't achieve. I mean, it's somewhat in the same vein. I've had to come to peace with, you know, I didn't have a successful stint in my, you know, career in media. I wasn't the all-star media person. That's not my legacy. My Wikipedia entry is not particularly good. Young man could have had it all blew it, you know. Um, It's almost like the journeyman quarterback thing. Maybe worse, I don't know. But certainly... You know, it's not like the all-star. Right. You have to come to peace with that. That's okay. I have a good life. I love what I do now with Crucible Leadership. So that, that's a huge lesson for folks is maybe that initial dream didn't work out, but that's okay. You know, there can be another vision that may even fit better. And so he is inspirational in his own way. Absolutely. And our next discussion guest, the next person we're going to talk about from a perspective perspective that's fun to say, a perspective perspective, <laughs> is Nancy Kane. And this one, Warwick, I'm not going to put you on the spot. I'll just, I'll, I'll put it out rhetorically. If I had to sort of say, who is the guest that Warwick was most excited to interview? I would, I would, I would tell people, if people ask me that, that Nancy Kane, Professor Nancy Kane would have been that person. And we actually, that conversation was so good, it was so, uh, so engrossing, so riveting, so detailed that uh, it actually took, it was a two-part episode. But Warwick, you know this better than, far better than I do. Uh, She's a Harvard Business School professor. You're a Harvard Business School graduate. So tell folks a little bit about Nancy and and, and why we had her on. So Nancy Kane, as you mentioned, she's a Harvard Business School professor, but she's a historian. And what she does is talk about historical leaders in a way that's relevant to MBA students today. So if you will, what lessons to current leaders in the corporate or nonprofit world, what can they learn from uh, historical leaders? And so she wrote this incredible book, Forged in Crisis, in which she talks about um, a number of leaders, Ernest Shackleton, Abraham Lincoln, uh, you know, former U.S. president, uh, Frederick Douglass, who also lived around the time of Lincoln, the great um, African-American abolitionist, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, who was a German Lutheran pastor that opposed Hitler and was executed uh, for his opposition. Rachel Carson, who founded the modern environmental movement and uh, fought against uh, DDT and those sorts of uh, uh, very harmful chemical sprays. But what's interesting is Shackleton, he's somebody that was this polar explorer in kind of the first uh, couple decades of the 1900s, it was sort of like the space race. Everybody wanted to be the first right. to get to the <laughs> North Pole, South, South Pole, you know, do it for king and country, you know, a number of different countries, uh, Norway, um, US, uh, and uh, England. So he was on a Shackleton, and he wanted to be, uh, lead the first expedition to go across Antarctica. So he leaves at around about 1915 or thereabouts, and he's all for king and country, and he's somewhere in southern Argentina, nearest place to go for, uh, you know, to the Antarctica. And all the weather reports say icebergs, ice flows are as bad as we've ever seen. I mean, like forever. Going now would be suicide. But because he's so driven, so anxious for glory, frankly, he goes 
when all the advice is this is madness. And of course, what happens, his ship gets uh, you know, trapped in ice and they're there for months and months and there's no radio. Um, this is like 1915. So he has, to, he has to combat the thought that my crew is probably going to die and it's my fault because I was so impetuous and glory hunting that I left when everybody told me not to. And his story is so remarkable because he's able to really push that behind him and move ahead. So that, that's a pretty tough crucible when your team may die because you were stupid, impetuous, and glory hunting. Right. And, and, Nancy, and Nancy Kane does a remarkable job in Forged in Crisis, in talking about the crucible itself and then the lessons of what came out of the crucible. And at the end of that, I mean, it's, it's a two-part episode. At the end of the second part of that episode, you, you kind of summed it up with her and asked her a question to say, you know, what, what, are, the, what are the two or three things that Shackleton did because not all the people who listen and I would say not many of the people who listen to our show are, are going to circumnavigate Antarctica. So um, what, what are the, 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 the takeaways for people who go through crucibles that Shackleton's life, uh, you know, uh, reveals? What are the two or three things of why Shackleton holds so many lessons for CEOs, leaders of nonprofits, leaders in the COVID-19 crisis that we're all going through, corporate leaders, governmental leaders, when everything is so uncertain, what are the key nuggets, would you say, that we need to learn about Shackleton? Um, well, just, just to kind of put, present them in uncharacteristically succinct form, you have, to, <laughs> you have to step into the fear, right? You take the step. Courage is not the absence of fear, as Mandela said, it's the willingness to walk into the fear kind of square your shoulders and tighten your core and realize you are still standing and can take the next step. And then other people behind you can take the first step. So step into the fear, um, feed and water yourself and your people carefully, both emotionally and physically and mentally. Keep your fingers tightly on the pulse, the morale of the people around you. Um, learn forward, face forward and learn, right? Let go of, of what of what was and what didn't work in the past, learn from it, and then then move forward. Uh, especially in crucibles and crises, there's just too much at stake to spend a lot of time rehashing the past. You know, I said on the Charlie Rose interview I did many many years ago, well, several years ago when my book came in, I said, you know, I learned and Shackleton learned that why is never the question, right? Why me? Why this? How? Why the suffering? Why the calamity? Why the failures? It's never why, it's what can I make in this wreckage and how can I get, how can I redeem, reclaim? And just as a crucible, it's about, you know, high flames, literally, and its ability to kind of reshape things. How can I, you know, be forged into something better and stronger and more committed to service? Yeah, I mean, well said. I mean, he, really the first thing was, okay, we're here. I blew it, I was an idiot. And I have some experience with that thought of I blew it. I was an <laughs> idiot with the takeover. Uh, fortunately, I didn't like, you know, almost kill people. But um, but he he moved on because he realized his mission changed. His mission was then I'm going to bring my crew back alive. I'm not going to lose anybody. Now the chances of him bringing his crew back alive was like one in a million or one in a billion. Right. It was a really really tough goal. But he was determined. He you know. Um, uh, made sure he you know, rationed food, he kept morale up, he gave everybody jobs. He was very focused on their emotional well-being. You know, he, you know, he, he laughed with them. He's, he's, he was very thoughtful and resolute. But as you said, he stepped, uh, as Nancy said very well, he stepped into the fear. He didn't avoid it. Uh, he was courageous. Um, he really, um, he thought through things and he didn't dwell in the past. He didn't dwell right. and why did we get it? He moved forward, okay? The mission has changed. I'm not going to cross Antarctica. That mission is dead. And that was a huge mission for him. That was a, a vision, a dream he was passionate about. Okay, that's gone. That's over. My new mission is to keep my team alive and I will do everything I can to make that happen. And because of his resoluteness 
uh, and perseverance, he got all his crew back. What is remarkable about his story, this is all happening in the middle of World War I, um, somewhere around 1919, 1920, when the war was over, um, some sadly were lost in World War I because they, some, one weeks after they got back to England, one of them you know, joined up and you know, was killed. I mean, these are patriotic folks. But a bunch of them, when he said, I'm going to go back to Antarctica, they said, I'm, as they called him, boss. I'm signing up, boss. What right. kind of leader, when he almost kills people, they said, right. I'm going back with you to the scene of the crime. That's almost insanity, but it shows how much they almost worshipped him and what a leader he was. Truly remarkable man. And the, um, a couple of other guests we've had in the perspective uh, area of shows. And as long as we're at Harvard, let's stay there. <laughs> we, we Indeed. Got, there's, Indeed. there's, you know, there, there, there's a couple more Harvard folks. Um, one of them uh, that we talked to for a perspective episode was Joseph Badaracco, uh, who wrote a couple of books that really um, uh, speak to some, some important ways to deal with move beyond crucibles. Um, uh, Talk a little bit about uh, why Joseph Badaracco was an interesting guest for us. You know, uh, here's a recent book, Step Back, which really talks about how important it is to reflect, which in, this, in the busy life that we live, uh, so many leaders, and they're all uh, connected to, you know, phones, emails, uh, constant messaging. There's so much going on that people don't take time to reflect. And if you just like some energizer bunny that's always acting and not reflecting, you probably won't make good decisions. You know, right. action is important, so is reflection. <clears throat> so it's almost like the lost art of reflection. But the book that really intrigued me was his earlier book from almost 20 years ago called Leading Quietly. And I remember reading an article about it, and then I read the book. And what was amazing is a lot of us, including me, we grew up with the heroic leadership model, you know, Winston Churchill, Abraham Lincoln, or superheroes in movies, and, uh, you know, great men, great women doing incredible things. He's written a book about a whole bunch of folks in, let's say, middle management that we never would have heard of, you know, just taking those quiet day-to-day -day steps to make a difference, even though you'll never read about it in Business Week. And right. that was haunting for me because I grew up wanting to be maybe not wanting to be, but thinking, okay, I can be the savior of the family business, bring it back to the ideals of the founder, have it be well run, be like this crusader or charge of the light brigade thing and Crimean War in the 1850s, whole nother story, but um, sort of this hero type. And I realized that heroic model of leadership is often dangerous, treacherous, and is often not helpful. So his model of leadership is different. And I found that very compelling, convicting, haunting even. Yeah. And the idea uh, of, of the importance of reflection, one of the things that struck me before we talked to him is you really can't, I mean, we've talked a lot here and we talk a lot about on, on the podcast, we talk a lot about the importance of learning the lessons of your crucible. What is, what's in there that, um, that, that you can learn and apply to moving forward beyond the crucible. And there's really no way to learn the lessons of your crucible if you don't reflect on um, and if, if you don't... Absolutely. One of the things he talks about is the difference between ruminating and reflecting. Right. And I'd never heard about this. I never thought about it. Ruminating is, oh my gosh, I'm an idiot. Why did I do that? I, I've right. spent some time ruminating. I, I fully <laughs> understand the concept of rumination. Uh, but reflecting is like, okay, I was an idiot, or maybe that wasn't fair, or that was awful, but what can I learn from it? What lessons can I learn? How do we move forward? And in general, as we're trying to build our vision and make it reality, where am I? Do I have the right team? You know, what lessons do I need to learn? What's the next step? You've got to reflect and act. It's, it's, a, it's a cycle. And, you know, and what he talks about is you can take, you know, maybe it's on the way to work. Maybe it's while you're working out. We all have times, if we really think about it, where we can consciously say, okay, I'm going to use this time to reflect. Right. Um, so, yeah, very profound stuff from uh, for him. So we'll move from Harvard Business School Professor Joseph Badaracco to uh, Harvard 
negotiation project uh, lecturer and Harvard Law School lecturer, Sheila Heen, another uh, perspective guest who, who talked about a, another thing that it seems to me is not possible to move beyond your crucible unless you do this, unless you're willing to do this. And that is have difficult conversations. Um, you really can't, as a leader in particular, and as a leader who is facing a crucible experience and trying to move past it, move beyond it, you're going to have to engage in, in, in some difficult conversations, aren't you? Absolutely. You know, she has two interesting books, though, is the one that she uh, co-wrote, Difficult Conversations. And then she has another one, which is Thanks for the Feedback. Thanks for the Feedback is intriguing because so often, you know, we're taught by HR and other folks, okay, how do you give feedback well? But she's talking about how do you receive feedback well, even right. if it's not particularly well given. That was a fascinating discussion. But really this whole notion of difficult conversations, many folks avoid it, whether it's your boss or people at work. And if they do it, it will often be done really poorly. Like yelling and screaming is not a good way to have a difficult conversation. No. You will almost <laughs> certainly won't be heard. You know, I don't yes. know if it will make you feel good or not, but it will accomplish pretty much nothing with almost 100% certainty, you know, yep. guaranteed. But she talks about really, you know, three paradigms, what happened, the feelings conversation, the identity conversation. We can always argue about, well, it was your fault, that was my fault, and you can debate about what happened, right? You can get into this all intellectual debate. You've, you're almost like having a court case. You can go there, but really what she focuses on, well, you know, focus on the feelings. Make sure the other person feels hurt. Like, I hear what you're saying. Obviously, that was devastating to you. Doesn't mean to say that you agree with what they're saying, but you acknowledge the feelings and realize, well, maybe part of it, you know, uh, they have a sense of identity that's wrapped up in their position. So her whole notion of how to have a difficult conversation, well, it is so good. Well worth listening to the episode and reading her book, Difficult Conversations. Great stuff. Well, that brings us, I've been waiting all show to say this. That brings us to the moment where I can see the, 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 the fasten seatbelt lights come on. The, <laughs> the, 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 it's, it, we're getting to the point, it's, you know, gather up your peanut bags. It's, we're getting to the point, it's almost time to land the plane. But we've got one more section before the plane touches down. We've got one more section to go through. And it really is, um, um, I see it as kind of the bookends to our conversation. And that is episodes that we've had in our first 49, this being our 50th, where we talk, it's, it's conversations between me and you. Uh, it's conversations about some of the key principles of crucible leadership. And what I like about what we chose is the, the kind of the two we're going to focus on is they really are the bookends from my perspective on what crucible leadership's all about. The first one we'll talk about is, uh, was an episode on perseverance fatigue. And the idea there, Warwick, is that if you're going to get through a crucible, you got to have perseverance. The, what we'll talk about after that, after we talk about perseverance fatigue, is we'll talk about one of our first episodes, episode four, uh, which was about significance over success. And I end every episode talking about how the lessons of your, how crucibles aren't the end of your story. They're the start of a story. It can be a most rewarding story because it leads at the end, if you learn the lessons of your crucible, to a life of significance. So this is a, this is truly um, a, a great place to, to land the plane. But let's talk first about uh, this idea of uh, perseverance fatigue. You say something in, um, in that episode um, that even when it feels overwhelming and there's no hope. Even when life can feel overwhelming and there's no hope, just take that, you know, one small step. It could be apply for that next position, even when you think it's hopeless. Have that one more uh, networking call. In J.K. Rowling's case, send out one more manuscript to one more publisher. You know, whatever the positive step is, uh, no matter how small, each day, try to take one small step. It could be journaling about the kind of position you would like to get, uh, but it's the importance of taking one small step uh, at a time each day, each week. That is probably the foundation of getting out of a bottomless pit. Even when that small step can seem like, well, even if it happens, so what? 
why is taking one small step so important to um, getting beyond your crucible? Yeah, I mean, there are times in which you've been through a crucible and maybe you're at, in the middle of it and you can feel like you're in, in the bottom of the pit. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. You know, if there is, it's, a, it's another train, you know, kind of hit you. I mean, it just things seem grim. There seems no hope. And so it can seem like, well, what's the point of taking one small step? I mean, I need to take a gigantic leap, but one small step, so what? I'll still be at the bottom of the, of, of the pit. But really, one small step can lead to another small step. It could be uh, maybe you were fired. It could be, okay, well, what other jobs can I take just thinking about that? Maybe you're dealing with a family illness. Maybe you're going to have a walk with a friend just to get your mind off things and just to, you know, recharge the batteries a bit. Those are all really important. So the power of one small step is, you know, it doesn't seem much, but one small step can lead to another. And, you know, pretty soon there's a flywheel, whether it's bringing a vision to reality, uh, getting through a crucible, um, the power of one small step cannot be underestimated to, um, you know, just help you move in a positive direction, you know, sitting and ruminating and saying, Oh, woe is me. That's not really going to get you anywhere. Taking one small positive step, no matter how small that is a step to getting out of the bottom of the pit. And there's a step towards having hope. Yeah. And, and I, I think if we went back and we, went through all of our guests, let alone all the guests we've talked about today, and we looked at their stories of bouncing back from their crucibles, moving beyond their crucibles, we would find a one small step that they took. Um, we would find, uh, I think that's, you know, uh, probably true of everyone. Oh, I'm sure it is. Um, you know, maybe with uh, Ernest Shackleton, it's like, okay, here we are, we're stuck in the ice. Well, Let's get the crew off and uh, let's get them in tents. So I think one time, you know, we had uh, some strange game, you know, animal, uh, vegetable, mineral, some kind of weird game to make right. people laugh, that laugh, you know, a little like charades or whatever. Well, that doesn't seem like a big step. Let's have a game. How's that going to get his crew rescued? It's not, but it's going to take their minds off things for maybe half an hour an hour. It's a small step, but it's an important small step. Yeah, absolutely. And um, what ends up with small steps, you build them, right? You, you, pu you put them together like a puzzle. You put them together like, like steps, one step after the other. Put one foot in front of the other as the Christmas special so, uh, so resoundingly says, if you put one foot in front of the other, soon you'll be walking out the door and soon you'll be getting through your crucible. Soon you'll be on the other side. And, and the and, other and side. And soon you'll be helping to ha have your vision become reality. Right. You know, the, one small and, step. And what that is, the other side of the door, when you get through the door, your vision becoming a reality, the goal that we talk about, the goal that you uh, talk about and have talked about at Crucible Leadership since the outset, even before this podcast existed, the goal that we're after is a life of significance. The first step is to leading a life of significance is understand what your fundamental beliefs and values are. And that is a critical point for listeners to understand because you said it just now. A life of significance is individual. Your life of significance is rooted in who you are. It's not what society deems necessary to do. It's what you, what your vision and you know, what your values and beliefs inform you to want to accomplish right absolutely absolutely and so that's really the um that's really the the key first step is uh just well it's it's a couple things in leading a life significance you've got to understand your fundamental beliefs and values and as we often talk about in crucible leadership you want to understand how you're wide how you're designed we're all wide a different way and again we've talked extensively on this but basically um to lead a life of significance, you want to feel like you're using the skills and abilities that I would say you've been divinely given uh, for a purpose that you feel um, off the charts, passionate about, that's in line with your fundamental beliefs and values, and you feel is accomplishing something significant. Those things will all line up by definition if it's something tied to your values and beliefs, 
well, then you will feel it's important and it's hard for that not to be significant if the vision is coming directly out of those values and beliefs and in some fashion helps other people. It, it will line up if you follow that path. Why is a life of significance the, the true north, that which we're aiming at as we look to emerge from a crucible? It's funny, you know, one of the things we don't do here is say crucible leadership, a life of success. And there's nothing wrong with success, but success in of itself doesn't satisfy, doesn't bring you joy. There's not one person that we've had on this podcast that can say success alone in of itself made me joyful and fulfilled. Not one person. We've had about as diverse group of guests and experience, life, nationality, background, experiences you could possibly imagine. And I'm not against success. Success is fine. You know, being able to have a nice vacation, a nice house or a nice life for your family, nothing wrong with that. It's all, that's good. But it doesn't bring happiness in itself. Significance, you know, we talk about significance as really a life of significance is based on your fundamental beliefs and values. Um, it's uh, something that you're passionate about. It's really a life significance is a life on purpose dedicated to serving others. That's really what a life of significance is. And it's when you bring joy to others, that's when you, know, you have joy you know, in, in your own eyes, you know, whether it's um, David Charbonnet seeing, you know, a vet getting a little bit more movement than he could, the, or he or she could the previous day. Okay, that's positive. Right. When it's seeing uh, Kathleen Merkel working with women leaders saying, boy, I can be successful and have a lot life, a balanced life and have joy. That brings Kathleen Merkel joy. When uh, Michelle Quay inspires people with hope, you know, uh, that you don't have to be defined by your narrative. You can be perfectly normal, even in your differences and in your hardships. That, you know, that sense of when you see the light in somebody's eye, when you see hope in somebody's eye, it brings you joy. It gives your life meaning. And when you think of the legacy concept and you're on your deathbed, okay, I've helped people. I've brought joy to other people. Hopefully I've brought joy to my family, a life well lived. I'm at peace. We all want to be at peace at that point in our lives. We all want to feel, okay, this is a life well lived. Uh, and that's what a life of significance is all about. So as we wrap up episode 50 of Beyond the Crucible, on a, on a discussion of living a life of significance. How has it felt for you in the 49 episodes that we've finished before this one with the feedback you've gotten from people who've heard it with being able to talk to people, having people say that they never really thought about their story like that until you asked them that question. How has the experience of this podcast in the first 49 episodes fueled your own life of significance? You know, in a couple of ways, um, I've loved getting to know a whole lot of people, pretty much none of whom I knew before. And uh, just hearing about their life of significance, um, hearing about um, kind of what they went through, their um, their experiences, just learning from um, learning from them, learning from uh, all of the things they've been through. So just, I feel like it's almost one massive PhD course in terms of <laughs> of the human spirit of how you combat adversity, how you combat uh, terrible things that happen in your life, how you all of them bounce back from so many different kinds of crucibles, and they have joy. All of them are leading lives of significance. All of them are focused on helping others. So just seeing the triumph of the human spirit and, 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 the, and using different ways maybe, but they all have hope, that was inspiring. Um, you know, I love, as you say, going for the heart. You know, what were you feeling, um, you know, when we were chatting to um, somebody who haven't talked about as much, Lisa Blair? Everybody wants to know about how she survived sailing single-handedly around Antarctica. Very few people ask her about what was it like to be a young girl growing up in Australia and being bullied. Um, right. 
and, you know, overcoming uh, dyslexia, reinventing yourself, having more confidence. People don't really go there, but I wanted to know, well, who is Lisa Blair? Not just the person you all read about, at least in Australian you know, publications. So with every guest, we want to know who is the real Sarah Nannan? Who is the real Kathleen Merkel? Who was the real Anna Shackleton? Who was the real Robert Krantz? We want to know who they really were, what they thought and felt. And so if that you know, hopefully brings some insight and hope to other people, one of the things we say here is we're dealers in hope. We like to offer hope. And if that offers people hope, then this is a worthwhile mission. So I feel like I've learned a lot from their stories. I've loved being able to share those stories with others. And it's given me hope personally, uh, more hope, not that I didn't have some before, but it's fueled that even more. So yeah, it's been an honor and a privilege to be able to hear the people's stories and to share them with others. Well, that, Captain Fairfax, is a perfect <laughs> landing of the plane. Uh, listener, thank you so much for spending what we know is a little bit longer time than you normally get to spend with us, but this was a celebration. We were having a party here talking about um, truly a milestone, 50 episodes of Beyond the Crucible. And uh, what we hope came out of this discussion, what we hope you take away from this discussion is um, what we say at the end of the 49 episodes that came before it. And that is this. We know, we understand, because we've been through them ourselves. We know your crucible, your crucible is painful. We know that those traumas, tragedies, setbacks, failures, um, change the trajectory of your life. But we also know as our, uh, from our personal experience and from what guests have shared on the show that those crucibles aren't the end of our stories and that pain is not the last thing that we'll feel. That if we learn the lessons of our crucibles and if we take one small step at a time moving forward, armed with those lessons to pursue a life on purpose to pursue life beyond the crucible. We know that the next chapter of our lives is going to be more uh, rewarding, that our crucibles are not the end of our story. They are in many ways, the beginning of our story. And it's a great new story because it leads to where the GPS takes us to the end of the line is a life of significance.